uh, saya Karuna. Uh, saya uh, kebetulan presentasinya Dr. Wicaksono, saya setuju sama uh, 99%. I agree with 99% of what he said. And I think it's great that he opened because he's touched on a lot of the points that I was going to, so I don't have to. Um, ini uh, saya mau uh, utamakan hari ini uh, how to make cities more healthy. Bukan it's just like what is a healthy city, but how to get there a little bit. So ini uh, let's go on. Uh, Pertamanya saya mau buka ini ini what is a healthy city? Kalau if you want to make a healthy city in the future, menurut World Health Organization, a healthy city is one that is continually creating and improving those physical and social environments and expanding those community resources which enable people to mutually support each other in performing all the functions of life and developing to their maximum potential. Ini saya mau highlight a uh, healthy city itu bukan kota anti sakit. It's not an anti-sickness city. The first thing about a healthy city is you have to have a good quality of life. You have to have the facilities which make an enjoyable quality of life. That is, as Babu Chaksono said, green spaces, parks, pedestrian access, things which encourage a mobile lifestyle. Um, like, it's like, you know, uh, the High Line, the New York, and it's just like, what do you do with old railroad tracks that aren't used anymore? You just make it something that's very pretty, but also functional. People can get around. Uh, any other pikiran pikiran kota, it's just like, you know, how do you make the city better? How do you make it more livable, not just more functional? Uh, this on the left over here is um, actually that's Munich. It's Munich, Germany. That's one of the biggest cities in Europe. And they have a surfing area right in the river. It's just like these small things. Um, so, so again, a healthy building is holistic. It's not just anti-sickness. Uh, so sorry, sorry, healthy city. So healthy building, similarly, it's a building that supports physical, psychological, social health and well-being. So belum orang sakit, before your people are stressed out and get sick and have all these issues with them, you want to make a building that's nice to begin with. So it's not just anti-sickness. And generally speaking, any very similar to recommendasi Prof. Jackson, what makes a healthy city? Free public facilities. That's it. I mean, it's just like active pedestrian corridors, green spaces, well-designed social spaces. Ini selain COVID, just in general, it's because after COVID, there's going to be something else. So whether it's an obesity crisis or it's going to be, um, you know, some other pandemic or anything, things are like that. And so free public facilities for everyone, not just for rich people in mansions, is what makes healthy city. Um, now, there's one thing I want to touch on uh, because it's been getting a lot of flack recently in the news. People are saying dense cities are no good or whatever. Anyway, what is the similarity between these two pictures? Now, population density. One looks super crowded, one looks pretty, but kind of crowded. On the left is Monaco, one of the richest cities in the world. Population density, 26,000 people per square kilometer. Port au Prince, Haiti, the poorest country in the Americas, and it's the capital city, same density. So, ini kalau bilang kesehatan atau health, karena kotanya padat, it's like, well, there are ways to deal with kapadatan. And it's the details that matter. Because one doesn't handle natural disasters, shocks, or pandemics very well. The other one handles them very well. Saya mau bicara lebih tentang physical change as a whole for uh, cities, how to make them more healthy. But because this is about COVID, I have to talk a little bit about COVID. Uh, there was a case study early on in the um, pandemic where uh, there was a bunch of super spreader cases around China and Seoul and other things. And they found that one uh, super spreader case happened in a call center. 79 people were infected on one floor. And the main reason for this was recirculated air with no uh, fresh air. It wasn't being sterilized or anything. It's just 
viral load being recirculated. The rest of the building only had three people. And so people are saying, wow, this is, this is the basis of it. It's like density. When people are close together, they will get sick. Um, that is not the case. Density is not the enemy. When you have a big city, when you have a big economic center, you have to have density. Um, otherwise, you just end up with traffic jams. People have to drive everywhere. So, um, oops, these are, this thinking was, you know, the governor of New York said, this is not life as usual. There's a density level in New York City that is destructive. It has to stop and it has to stop now. New York City must develop an immediate plan to reduce density. And I say, Andrew Cuomo doesn't know what he's talking about. So, because density is not the enemy. Um, you know, the thing is, uh, oops. Uh, the cities that have best dealt with COVID in the world have been some of the densest. Hong Kong has had 10 cases a day average until today. Delhi is averaging 2,777. Urban Hong Kong is about four times more dense than Delhi. I mean, it's like China. China is having giant pool parties because they don't really care about COVID anymore. It's a, it's a weird thing. These are the densest cities in the world and they're handling it well. Um, so it's not about density. It's about how you manage the density. And so now if we're going through comparisons here. Here's a comparison that people don't really think about. Tokyo is the biggest metropolitan area in the world. Jabodetabek is the second biggest. Population density is about the same. Populations are about the same. Jabodetabek is actually on track to be the biggest city in the world in about two years. It's adding about a million people a year. So, and Tokyo and Jakarta are very similar. Uh, they're about the same size. I mean, if you factor out the parts of Tokyo that aren't really Tokyo, like the islands in the middle of the sea, they're both Asian megacities. They both similar population. They have massive flooding issues, government and business centers, archipelagos, uh, earthquakes, tsunamis, volcanoes, and democracies. So they are very similar but they are very different. So one question is, well, how does Jakarta become, well, Jakarta shouldn't be Tokyo, but how does it become more like a Tokyo? How does it become more developed? A million things. But while we're here, I'm just gonna talk about density and physical change because I got 15 minutes. <laughs> so urban growth, uh, Jakarta, the context, was 6 million people in 1976, became 9 million in 1989, 13 million by 2004. And since then, the population of Jakarta has not really grown, central Jakarta. Everything has been Bodetabek. So, so Jabodetabek has been growing. It's adding about 2 million people a year. Jakarta DKI is growing about 100,000 people a year. It's about 1% or less. Uh, there's just no more space in DKI. And most of the areas that were grown from 1976 and 2004, uh, from a population standpoint, most of it was never planned. It was kampungs. Um, and so a lot of this has become a little bit of an issue uh, about how manageable a city is and how well it can manage pandemics or manage pollution or traffic. So the big problem uh, in terms of managing large scale things has been an issue of rights, uh, an issue of legality. Um, the formal and informal development is a common problem in the world. And uh, it's exacerbated by the fact that Indonesia is a democracy because while somebody's house might be illegal, their vote is not illegal and politicians when you start making policies and rules on urban planning based around the nearest election cycle versus best practice, you end up with pretty bad laws or laws that don't make sense. Um, and one of the things about this is land acquisition, which is super, super tricky because some of the most prime central areas that could be used for transit oriented development and public goods in Jakarta are occupied by kampongs. Um, unhealthy, high density, but crowded, cramped, Delhi style kampongs. And, you know, this is, you know, a good illustration of that. It's, 
uh, the reality on the ground. Um, you can have you can have skyscrapers uh, and fancy buildings next to slums, and this happens everywhere. And the thing is, sanitation is a public good. If you live in a Lima Pulo Lima Juta Prometo Prosegi high rise apartment, but there's a malaria outbreak next door in the Kampung, you might get malaria. <laughs> it's a public good. Every, it, it's everyone has to be uh, counted for. Um, and then, of course, you know, how fancy can you be if the river next door smells like dead fish and the sidewalk is collapsing? So, again, it's like to be a healthy city, you have to have good public goods for everyone. So um, I'm going to jump into a case study later, but just to lay it out some of the summaries of Jakarta and the conditions on the ground. This is not new for everyone, but Jakarta land prices are generally unaffordable. Um, this was not always the case. Uh, pre, uh, pre 1990, it was actually pre in, in the eighties, you could still do large scale land acquisition. It doesn't exist anymore. Um, really, but Real estate in the sky is free. It's just a legislation issue. Plot ratio can be managed up. Construction costs are becoming less and less relevant. Before, uh, apartment developers and housing developers would just basically say, land is basically free, long time ago. Um, figure out how much it costs to build it, put a margin on the construction cost and go. Now, construction cost is like a transaction cost. It's really about how much should you buy the land for and how much will you sell the land for, which is becoming more uh, like expensive developed Asian countries. Uh, government land is massively underutilized. There's a lot of government land, which for regulation reasons is just untouchable. It's like, who does it belong to? Whose permission do you need? Is it SECNAC? Is it, is it like the OMN? Is it, you know, there's, there's all these areas of Jakarta which could be used much better. Uh, so that's an opportunity. Uh, kampungs are suboptimal for healthy low-income housing. Um, that's a good and bad. They can be redeveloped. They should be redeveloped. Uh, no one should be sleeping two meters from a got, but that is the reality for most kampung developers, uh, kampung residents. Uh, large scale land acquisition in kampung in Jakarta by the private sector alone is impossible. Uh, we, we run the World Trade Center complex in Jakarta, it's 10 hectares. We've been trying to clear three hectares behind the site over the past 20 years. In 20 years, we have acquired two hectares. It looks like it's not contiguous. It's a scattered everything, like someone sneezed on a map. Um, it's not usable. <laughs> it's been 20 years. We can't even clear three hectares. Um, and this is the case. Uh, since uh, Reformasi, there have been no uh, consolidations of uh, informal space in Jakarta for over 20 years. Um, and there's no clear legal mechanism to enforce eminent domain on informal settlements. That's why all of the flyovers in Jakarta have been built over rich neighborhoods where the homeowners complain because you can try to force it down them. But politically, it's very difficult. Even if the closest point A to point B goes through a kampung, you just can't do it. You have to go through the expensive neighborhood and force the people in expensive houses to take it. And this is because there's too much politicization. So. One obvious solution is make plot ratio infinite for affordable low income housing. Uh, physically stack your public services so everything can fit in one place. This is dry, I'm getting to a case study if anyone's a thing. Uh, consolidate low rise kampungs into high rises like pretty much every other high income Asian city and make parks, schools, public transport, sanitation facilities, fancy offices, shopping malls for rich people, et cetera, with the newly available land and make the people in the fancy offices and the shopping malls for rich people pay for everything because that is a mechanism. So here is a case study I just wanted to show. Uh, this is the platinum triangle. It is the most expensive land in Indonesia. People know about the golden triangle, but there's a platinum triangle inside the golden triangle. It has you know, the same photo that everyone sees BNI 46 in central Jakarta. Uh, and what people don't realize is down here in the middle of all of this is actually a kampung. Uh, this is the area, Jalan Margono, Sudirman, Mas Mansur, and right in the middle of this, behind BNI 46 and the Shangri-La Hotel, there is a five-hectare kampung. Uh, 
uh, it is been there for a while and the site is surrounded by billionaires and they cannot touch it. I mean, even if they threw all the money they could at it, they would not be able to clear it. Uh, and this is also not, you know, it, it's also a perfect location for public parks and transit oriented developments, train stations, everything, but it's being occupied by low rise Kampung. Uh, it's got five, it's at 4,500 people and they occupy an area of five hectares. Now here's the thing, uh, if you put those people in high rise urban housing, this little yellow box here, you can literally move everyone in this entire site into the yellow box. You don't have to displace anyone. You don't have to destroy any communities that have been built. You don't have to destroy any businesses that have been built. Everything will fit in about 5,000 or so square meters. Um, so, and then you have a bunch of space left over. <laughs> And so how you do this is you basically make plot ratio much higher. You say the sky is free. We're going to move everyone into a high rise tower, uh, move all their businesses into a high rise tower or, or into, into a retail platform and stack everything. Then you have more space to develop things like proper roads, transport hubs, mixed commercial use, uh, more business, more life, more people, more tax revenue and parks, parks. Jakarta needs more parks. Jakarta has no parks outside of monuments and graveyards. There are no large free green spaces in Jakarta. So this can be done. And what would that housing look like for the people in the kampungs who've been moved? This is like Singapore HDB, boring but better. Even better if you go that way with high, super high rises and well designed and it's doable with the right incentives and because construction costs are relatively getting cheaper and cheaper this is actually doable because of the price disparity between what can be achieved with a kampung and a shiny 50-story high rise next to it and how much that 50-story high rise is willing to pay to resettle and redevelop whatever is going on in the kampung so why aren't things like this happening uh democracy <laughs> uh, and it's it's complicated because the countries that do this the best like China are authoritarian they tend to just smash the gumbungs and just build stuff but there there are softer and more manageable ways to do this um, and why democracy sometimes you pick a good leader sometimes you don't populism often makes for bad policies and then there's always this question of whose city is it anyway who gets to make the choices and there's many advocacy groups and some of them push um, very short term non best practice solutions and some of them push good solutions, but it's it's kind of a free for all right now. And without a clear direction from the government, it's kind of random what happens. Uh, and this is not just in Kampung resettlement, this is in everything. Jakarta is the fastest city in the world, sinking city in the world and nobody has a plan for it beyond one election cycle. So in fact, people who do illegal things for democracy purpose are actually protected. Like someone who knocks over the seawall because they decide they don't like it and floods a neighborhood, you can't blame them because they're in the kampung and they have a vote, kind of funny. So what to do? Um, one of the things that can be done is raise awareness and push for comprehensive public services, just do it more. Uh, it sounds wonky, but Gael Bay regulation is a thing, I mean, you. I mean, I don't know, take it to Instagram, Twitter. I mean, it's how you make this a popular rallying cause. Um, demand quality of affordable housing for Jakarta and make more public space. It just, Jakarta needs space. There's no space. Where is the space gonna come from? Uh, and practically speaking, from a legal standpoint, it could come from government land of which there is a lot, but a lot of it is taken by Kampung. <laughs> And the people living in those kampung are not le necessarily living in the healthiest, best conditions. And so how do you make those central areas in Platinum Triangle, in Tana Abang, in, you know, core Jakarta, just spitting distance from Monas and, you know, Gambir, how do you make those uh, more livable for the people inside them, get the value and make the facilities that are needed for everyone else in Jakarta? So that is all. I know this is very different from what Jane uh, kind of presented, but...